Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Everybody okay this afternoon? Um, I came to church today, and everybody was asking me, are you okay? Uh, two things. One was, how is your fever? Uh, and two is, how is your house? So uh, for some of you, uh, you saw that I had my second vaccination shot on Friday, and uh, yesterday I had a fever of 37.9, so not too bad, but I did not feel great, and I just felt ich, ich. In Japanese they say, fushi bushi ga itai, right? Just aches and pains. And so I took a nap, I woke up, I still did not feel good, and I thought, ugh, maybe I cannot preach on Sunday. But I woke up this morning, uh, not great sleep, but uh, no, no fever, so that's good. And also yesterday, uh, it was raining heavy, and I, I sent a video of uh, the neighborhood around my house, I was standing in water up to my knees and, uh, uh, as I was walking home. And fortunately, our house is a little, little bit high, a little bit high. So the water did not go over our porch. So, yeah, so the house, the house was okay. Yeah, the waters go up and the waters went down. We're okay. Thank you, Lord, for protecting us. Yeah. So, praise God, praise God. So, um, Yuki, do you have the map? Map there? So, uh, I just want to also thank you, say thank you to Miwa and, and of course, Makiko-san. Um, today's uh, music that we were singing about God of creation and the God who made heaven and earth and the God who saves us, that is exactly the message that we have today. The reason is, uh, the message is not from the Old Testament Bible. There is a, a short sermon in our passage today from Acts chapter 14. And from verse 13 to verse 17, it is a short sermon by Paul to uh, non-Jewish people. And because it's not to Jewish people, he doesn't use Jewish words. He doesn't talk about Abraham, Joseph. Moses, David, none of those words. You see, in the book of Acts, there are 35 sermons in this book. And this is the first sermon that we read that has nothing from the Old Testament, except for Genesis chapter 1. That's here. And so, uh, I'll get into it a little bit more, but um, the reason I have the map here is you look, uh-oh, battery's dying. No pointer. Okay, well, at the top right, excuse me, no, at the top of the map, there's Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, uh, Persia, Lystra. So those places have um, Jews, but most of those are non-Jews. So people who don't know the Bible. They don't know the Old Testament. And that's where the message is going to. So, Anyways, I uh, wanted to just share that because, uh, yeah, our message today with, was matched perfectly with the songs that we were singing. So uh, thank you, Lord, for orchestrating that. Yeah. Does anybody have a battery? That uh, looks like triple A. Yeah, back there. Yeah. Oh, this one? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. All right. So while we're figuring that out, let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 14. It's there in your bulletin. It also is on the screen in front. But I encourage you, please have your own Bible or Bible app open and ready. Um, I want us to read together from verse 8 to 10. We'll read together from verse 8 to 10. And then I will finish the story from 11 through 20. Okay? Are you ready? Okay. So let's read together Acts 14 from verse 8. In Lystra there, wa there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Let me continue. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, thank you, in Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city, uh, bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We, are, we too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go on their way. Yet he has not left himself without a testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. And even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. The very words of God. Amen. The subject of our sermon today is the price of victory. The price of victory. So, Go back with me to ancient Rome. There was a poet, philosopher, author named Ovid. O-V-I-D. And he wrote an epic poem. It goes like this. Jupiter and Mercury came down from Mount Olympus to a place called Asia Minor. Let's go to the map, Yuki. Jupiter and Mercury came down from Mount Olympus and went to the place called Asia Minor. This is Asia Minor. This is now Turkey, modern-day Turkey. He's a Roman poet. And so the Roman gods of Jupiter and Mercury are the Greek gods of Zeus and Hermes. Okay? So Zeus and Hermes, they came down and they visited Asia Minor. And 
they came as two poor men going from city to city. They were asking for hospitality, for someone to open up their home and let them stay there so they could bless them. They went to a thousand homes, but no one would open their house except one. One poor house, not even made of stone, but made of wood and had a grass roof. They opened their home to the two travelers. And that little house was so blessed by Zeus, the great god, Jupiter, that that house became the temple. And it became the temple of Zeus in Asia Minor. Fifty years later, after this poem was written, two men named Saul and Joseph, Saul also named Paul, and Joseph also named Barnabas, Barnabas, came from, not Olympus, but from Antioch. Actually, they, they were traveling, and they went to this island, and then they took a boat and entered the, the land. They were traveling to different cities. And in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 7, you read the story of their travel in Iconium. But anyway, 50 years after the epic of Ovid, two men named Saul, also called Paul, and Joseph, also called Barnabas, came to the city of Lystra. What were they doing? By day, they would go into the market, they would set up a shop, and they would do business. What is their business? They would make a tent. You know, they worked with animal skins, they would boil them and cook them, and then they would, you know, help people fix their tent or or sell tents. And they would do that from Sunday to Friday. But on Saturday, you could not find those two men in the market. Why? Because on Saturday, they would go to the local Jewish gathering called the synagogue. And they would meet there with their Jewish brothers and sisters, and they would talk and and speak about uh, this man named Jesus, Yeshua, from Jerusalem, excuse me, from Nazareth, who was crucified in Jerusalem, but after three days, he was resurrected. So it showed that he was actually God himself. And he was the, the one that the Jewish people were waiting for. And so Paul... And Barnabas would preach this message in the Jewish gatherings. But from Sunday to Friday, they would go into the market. And while they're at the market doing their business, they would, people would ask them, why are you here? What are you doing here? Oh, you're doing business. But why don't you do business on Saturday? Oh, you're Jewish. What kind of Jew are you? Well, we are Christians. We are from the small Jewish, small Jewish uh, section called the Christian. What is a Christian? Well, we follow a teacher named Jesus the Christ. He rose from the dead and now he's ascended to heaven. He gives us his spirit to live and to have joy and peace. He makes us new human beings and he has sent us here and so the people would listen to that and say, you're not here to sell tents, are you? You know, there's lots of people who come to Japan who are English teachers. You know? They work at the Eikaiwa, they're working at the high school, they're ALTs, they're in the universities. 
and they're teaching English from Monday through Saturday. But on Sunday, they're not working, right? Yeah. But even from Monday to Saturday, though they're teaching English, they're actually there to share their God, to talk about their Messiah. If you ever meet one of these people, pray for them. They really need all the prayer they can get. So Paul and Barnabas, they're talking in the marketplace with Jews and Gentile, non-Jewish people. And they're talking about God giving them new life, new identities. And to prove it, God gives them powers. So they're preaching, right? And we come up, we pick up the story, all right, in verse 8. Uh, verse 8, where's the verse 8? Ah, uh, yes, in Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking, maybe in the marketplace somewhere, maybe in the synagogue. Paul looked directly at him and saw he had faith to be healed. Paul knew by looking at this man sitting on the ground, this man knows. This man understands. He cannot walk, but he's willing to reach out to the God who made him. And he believes that if God could make him, God could heal him. He, he, Paul could see it. And you know that. When you talk to some people face to face, you look in their eyes and you think, maybe this person, maybe this person can believe in Jesus. That's what Paul saw. And so in verse uh, 9, Paul looked directly at him, verse 10, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, that law, that command, that, that message, the man jumped up and began to walk. So this man never walked a day in his life. Did not just get up, he jumped up, right? He jumped up and began to walk. That is power. That is the Gospel power. Is that the victory? No. Our title for the sermon is The Price of Victory. You think maybe, oh, God heals a man. God brings him back to life. He couldn't walk his whole life, but now he can walk. He can get a job. He can find a new life. He can live for his own, you know, his community and, and, and serve people. The victory is not the physical healing. The victory is that he believed. Amen? That's the victory. Here in Japan, what is the healing that God brings? Here in Japan, what is the most common thing that people need God to heal them, to jump up? I'm convinced it's not physical. It's psychological. It's mental. Depression. Bipolar conditions. So utsubyo. Right? Uh... Yeah, and all, all of those related to the hikikomori, you know, all, all, everything related to psychological, you know, mental disease. And I, I've seen it once, I've seen it a, a plenty of times. God heals people. God restores them. God brings them to new life. One of my best friends, my longest friends, we went camping together this last Tuesday before the rain started. He's one of my longest friends here in, in Japan. He, was the, he, was a, a, de, he had depression. I mean, the first time I met him, he was sitting right where Yukari was sitting. And he, when you talked to him, he was just like this. Hello. Just like that. Just like a vegetable with two feet. 
And over time, he believed the gospel. God healed his heart and his mind. Restored him. He's married. He has two beautiful children. We went camping together. He has a job. God restored him. God healed him. But the victory is not that he's married. The victory is that he loves God. And God has saved him. Right? That's the victory. And God does that here in Japan. God is doing it again and again. So, Paul and Barnabas, they heal this man, and they have this great victory. And it's not only in Lystra, okay, but in, you know, the, the, the city before that. Go back, Yuki, go back to, uh, you, you don't have it in your bulletin, okay. Uh, go back, is there one before this? Yeah, this is in Iconium. This is in uh, chapter 14, but not in your bulletin. It's in your Bible. Okay, this is 1 through uh, 7. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, this is in Iconium. And there, they, Paul and Barnabas, they were speaking, they were preaching. They spoke so effectively, a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. They believed. Great victory. Great victory, okay? But now the price of the victory. The price of the victory. In Iconium, some Jews refused to believe. They stirred up other Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Verse 3, Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders, healings. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. So, um, here's what happens. Paul and Barnabas, there's victory. People are growing. A church is established in the city of Iconium. And then there's opposition, internally, externally. Now, you can go, go ahead and go to our passage. That's one kind of price price of opposition. The price of opposition. But the second price, here. So, uh, uh, I'll go next, next slide to verse 11. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. They thought, wait a second, this is the myth, this is the poem, this is the prophecy of Jupiter and Mercury, Zeus and Hermes. They've come. We better open up our home. We better give hospitality. We, this is our chance for blessing. This is our chance to show them that, that we're not one of those hundred thousand or a thousand homes that closed our doors. We're, we'll be open. We have to welcome Zeus. And they thought, well, Paul was the one always talking. He's the messenger. He's the smaller God. Hermes. And Joseph, also known as Barnabas, was back there, you know, smiling, you know. Oh, he must be the, the big one, Jupiter, Zeus, right? So Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes. So the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the sea, this is in Lystra, they brought bulls and wreaths, right? They wanted to sacrifice Misunderstanding. Yeah, so, uh, you know, that's what happens here. There's victory, there's people coming to Christ, there's healing, there's wonderful things happening. There's also accusation. Wait a minute, Christians, are you part of that cult? Are you from the Mormons? Are you from the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? Are you, you know... Many of us who are of orthodox Protestant faith, we get included with the unorthodox churches. And we get misunderstood and mislabeled. Ah, maybe from that Korean cult. Maybe from, you're the, you're the church, you're the people that didn't close your doors during COVID and you became the super spreader. Is that you? Ah, Christians, okay. 
I see. You're the religious people. And here's the biggest misunderstanding of the Christian gospel message. Here it is. Ready? The biggest misunderstanding. I can become a Christian to make my life better. I can be a better person if I go to church. So church and the Bible and the Christian Faith is something I add to my life as a part of, it's like a new hobby or a new interest. And, you know, I give or I spend time with church people or I go to church and I, you know, I can become better. That's the biggest misunderstanding. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not that you can become better. The gospel is that God makes us new. The God is not here. God is not here, okay, to improve. God is here to transform, to change, all right? So here it is. Christian, the Christian life is not to take, you know, you, you let God into your story. No, no, no. You're not the hero, okay? The Christian life is, you join God's story. You join His story. He does not become part of your identity. Your identity is new. Your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing. But there's always misunderstanding. Like these people in Lystra. They misunderstood they thought, oh yes, Zeus, our God, uh, uh, the, the God of our area, Asia Minor. And Paul says, no, no, there's a greater God than Zeus. There's a greater God than, there's a greater mountain than Olympus. There's a, who is he? Who is he? Uh, so they, they, they think, oh boy, they're, you know, they're going to try to, they're treating us like God. So what did they, they, they tear their clothes, right? In the Bible, when somebody tears their clothes, that means they're saying, no, it's a great fear or a great sorrow. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago in the Olympics? I think it was a, in the track and field hur, hur, hurdles. And I, there was a, he was, he was a white athlete. Maybe Norway or Austria, maybe. Yeah, he, he, he won the race. He got a new world record, and he, he tore his, you know, ha, ah, ah, ah. But then he was too weak, so it didn't open all the way. So we went, oh, one more time, ha, ah, ah, and it still didn't work, right? I thought that was funny. That's not what happened here, okay? All right, right? Yeah, so in the Olympics, you, you tear your shirt because you're victory, you're Superman. Here, they say, no, I'm not God. I'm not Zeus. I'm, don't do this. This is wrong. And they tear their shirt. Right? And so they tear their shirt and they say, no, no, no. They, they, they didn't figure it out because Paul and Barnabas, they're speaking in Greek the whole time. But the Lyconian, the, the Lystra people, they, they see, Ooh, and they start speaking in Lyconian. And Paul and Barnabas, they don't understand Lyconian. So they're talking, go get the animals, go get the you know, flowers. And by the time Paul and Barnabas understand, oh, oh gosh, this is not good. And they tear their clothes. And this is where Paul gives a, you know, a quick, impromptu message. Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. That is where he starts. He doesn't start with Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Daniel, Dayton, none of those. He starts with the God of wonders beyond our galaxy. That's where he starts. Heaven and earth. Because that's what they understand. Right? 
Yeah. In the past, verse 16, he let all nations go to their own way. If you are taking a note, this is a key verse. Verse 16. You should write down in your notes or take a mental note. Deuteronomy, Shinmeki, verse 32, excuse me, chapter 32, verse 8 and 9. Deuteronomy, chapter 32, verse 8 and 9. I don't have the slide. It's okay. This is key, though. Verse, chapter 32 of, of Deuteronomy, God is talking about the Tower of Babel. And at the Tower of Babel, also in Genesis chapter 10 and 11, God says, well, the people, okay, come with me, come with me, okay. At the Tower of Babel, here it goes. All the people of the world say, let's make God our pet. Let's control God. Let's make our name great. And let's show ourselves to be so great that we don't need God. So they build a ziggurat, like a tower, like a pyramid. A pyramid is square, but a ziggurat is round. It's wide at the bottom, narrow at the top. It's like a mountain that goes round and round and round with the stairs that go all the way up. They build this great tower at Babel. To say, we are greater than God. We don't need God. We are our own power. And God looks down and he says, no, no, no. And at that time, God says, look, you don't want me? You don't need me? You don't want me to be your God? You don't worship me? Okay. Ski no yoni. Dozo. And he says, he says here in verse 8 of chapter 32, Deuteronomy, God divided the nations according to the Elohim, <clears throat> excuse me, the sons of God, according to the number of all the host of heaven, the spiritual, supernatural powers. He said, Persia, you have your own spiritual God. He said, Greece, you have your own spiritual being that you will make your God. Uh, Phoenicians, you have your own. Rome, you have your own. Okay? Japan, you have your own God that, you will, that will rule over you. But he said in verse 9, chapter 32, Deuteronomy, but Jerusalem, Israel, Jacob is God's portion. So God says, I will keep one people for myself, Israel. And so... Genesis chapter 12 is the story of Israel, starting with Abraham. All right, sorry, had to take a little detour, but um, that's to help us understand our Bible. So, verse 16, in the past, he let all nations go their own way. Deuteronomy 32. 17, yet he has not left himself without a testimony. However... God let everybody go. However, he's still going to keep everybody. He's going to bring everybody back through his people, through Abraham, through Israel, through Jesus, who was from Abraham. He's going to call all his people back. So, watch now, there's people in Rome. There's people in Babylon. There's people in Persia. There's people in Greece people in Phoenicia, people in Japan, that he's going to bring back to himself. That's what Paul is saying. He's not left himself without a message, a testimony. What's his message? You know it. In your heart, you know somebody made all of this. Somebody makes this go. You know that there is someone, not something, someone that I can use, that I can, uh, uh, not use, but w that I know is the standard of absolute right and wrong. So let me give you an example. Yesterday, I was in bed with a fever, and I was flipping through YouTube, <laughs> wasting time. <laughs> 
No? Is it me? I'm the only one? Everybody here never, never wastes time on YouTube? All right, that's fine. Everybody's holy, righteous. I get it. Okay. So I'm in bed <laughs> flipping through YouTube, and um, I'm flipping through some music. So there's a song that uh, someone wrote, and they're questioning God. God, how could you kill so-and-so? God, why do you let the good people die, but y you let the bad people live? God, how could you be so terrible? Who are you, God? And they're just making this song, questioning God about why he lets other people live, but some people die, and things like that, okay? And then... A Christian made a song as an answer to that song. Amazing answer. I want to read it to you. It sounds like what we read here. But the reason I was so amazed at this song was that, I don't know, okay, I don't know. I'm, making, I'm speaking to a mixed group here, maybe also on YouTube. Have you ever seen on YouTube, they're called reaction videos? Reaction videos? So, okay, it's okay. There's YouTubers, right? And they will watch a song or listen to a music for the first time. And they will, they will respond. They will react. Hey, sugoi. Oh, this is amazing. Oh, good song. Like that. I like this line, or this one was strange. It's a reaction, okay? Is that okay? Yeah, all right. So I watched about 20 of those videos about this song. I know it's confusing, but anyway, here's the thing. None of the people who watched the song were Christians. All of the people who watched this reaction video were non-Christians but they're listening to a Christian song. And all of them said, this is amazing. This is true. These are facts. This is powerful. I should, I'm not a Christian, but I believe this. So I want to share with you some of those words. The writer wrote the song as if he was God. I'm going to let you know who you're questioning. I am the God who created the earth. I knew you'd start being proud, so I made you from dirt. There's no battery in your body. So who is making you work? I made the earth perfect. The people are making it worse. Who put the seed in the fruit? And put the fruit in the tree, and that tree in another little seed, but me. I am the one that put breath in your lungs, and created the same mind that you question me from. You are lost. I am the way. I am the potter. You are the clay. And now the clay has something to say? Okay. You can never check me. So check this. Your standard for right and wrong is me. I am the checklist. I am right. Who, wrong is whatever you're left with. I am life. You without me is what death is. I am the judge. You answer me. If I throw lightning, who throws it back at me? The answer? Nobody. If all this falls, who can stand but me? You go to the cross before you cross-examine me. You say, I made mistakes. You mistake me. You made gods out of men who were clay to me. Here's the best part. The best part of the song. And this is the gospel. You ask... Why do the good die young? The truth is, nobody's good, not even one. The only one who's ever been good is God's son. So to answer your question, the good died once. You ask the question, 
Why do the good die young? The truth is, nobody's been good, not even one. The only one who's ever been good is God's son. So to answer your question, the good died once. The real question is, what are you living like? If I punish every sin, would you live tonight? And the song goes on. Twenty non-Christian YouTubers watched this song, listened to the lyrics, and thought, that's the truth. That's the truth. Not Christian. They thought, I, I don't go to church, I'm not religious. But what he's talking about, about God making everything, about putting breath in my lungs, and the mind that I question God with, that's true. If God throws lightning, who can throw it back? And so Paul is preaching about God who's shown kindness, giving rain from heaven, crops in their seasons, provides food and fills hearts with joy. Everybody knows in their heart of hearts, God makes all of this. And we answer to God. That's Paul's message. So what's their response? They want to kill him. Okay. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Let's go to the next one. Verse 19. Some Jews came from Antioch, Iconium, and they won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. One minute, they say, you're a god, you're Hermes, you're Zeus. The next minute, people are coming from other cities. They want to kill him. And they leave him dead. After the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. This is crazy. Paul, what, what are you doing? You are near death. You almost died. So they stone him. He's lying maybe half dead. And they're thinking, okay, we have to bury him outside the city. We have to call one of the you know, Jewish priests. We have to perform the things. And oh, this is terrible. Who is his mother? Do you know where he's from? Tarsus? I don't know. What do we do with his business? They're thinking all this. And then Paul's like, where is everybody? <laughs> I have to go back and preach. That's amazing. So uh, we're going to close with just the title once more. What's the, what's the price of victory? The price of victory. The price was misunderstanding. Victory. There's no success. There's no victory. There's no great achievement without a price. You know this. And people will see that you're a Christian, they see that you follow Jesus or want to do something for God, and they will misunderstand. They think, oh, you just another cult member, or you think this is another hobby, this is another interest. They'll misunderstand. That's a, that's a small price, okay? The big price is death. They want to kill you. So, Here's the wrong question. The wrong question is, how much do you want to pay? It's the wrong question. Okay? If, I, if I ask you, how far will you go for Jesus Christ? That is a terrible question. I'm a bad teacher. That's not the question. How much are you willing to pay? How far are you willing to go? Don't ask that question. The question you should ask is, how much do you remember that God paid? What's the price that God paid for your victory? How far did God go to save you? Right? Because the more you understand how much Jesus gave, how much Jesus paid, the more you will be willing and able to go. Amen? 
What did Jesus lose? What did Jesus give up? Read Proverbs chapter 8. His relationship with the Father. Pure delight. Eternal intimacy. No greater love between two people than God the Father, God the Son. They delighted in each other eternally. A wonderful relationship of love. Selfless love. You know, I have five sons and one daughter. Oh, man. You can have my sons. Okay? Seriously. Look, I, I can have a terrible day. I, I can go home. My sons are leaving. The, you know, they destroyed the house. They, things are a mess. My wife, she could hate me, call me lazy, stupid, like she usually does. You know, and just a terrible day. But all... If my daughter comes to me, give me a hug and a kiss, I'm in heaven. Okay? That's all I need. My daughter, she's just my, my life. Okay? Now, yeah, she's my life. Yeah, okay. Jesus is my life, but my daughter is my life. Okay. So, anyways, the relationship I have with my daughter, that is just a drop, a drop of the relationship Jesus has with the Father. Just a small part. Eternal bliss. 1,000% intimacy with God the Father. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, my God, my God, why? Why have you abandoned me? Jesus lost the greatest thing so that he can have us. That's the price that he paid. That was the price for our victory. So if how far are you willing to go? How far do you know he went for you? If you can answer that question, you can answer the other one. Amen? All right, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for paying the ultimate price of giving up your son. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son. Thank you. And Father, if people misunderstand us, if people oppose us, if people want to push us out, oh God, give us greater love. Let us overcome evil with good. For the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen.